Hi, it's Rick Picotta. Welcome to our session. I would like to introduce my co-conspirators, uh, Jan uh, Schoenberger. Jan has been with us doing this for a number of years now. Jan is at the Los Angeles County USC Medical Center, my alma mater. She was the residency program director there for about eight years and moved up the ladder now. And she's uh, the vice chief for education and administration. The other folk that has come to you is uh, Ken Milne. Ken, you know him from his Skeptic's Guide to Emergency Medicine. Uh, Ken won the ASAP Education Award a couple of years ago. Jan won the California ASAP Education Award about uh, three years ago. And so I'm bringing these folks together so we can look at some literature and look at uh, something that is kind of provocative. I think the idea here is to find and challenge uh, what we do on a daily basis. So the first paper is kind of a great example of it. Uh, the first paper is entitled, let me see, get this title up here, The Methodological Appraisal of the Heart Score and Its Variants. Uh, everybody uses the heart score. Everybody thinks it's fabulous. And here are Dave Schreiger and uh, Steve Green from Loma Linda and, and Dre, Dave's from UCLA. And they're basically saying, not so fast, not so fast. This thing uh, has, has a, a number of problems. In fact, if you compare it to the standards set by the uh, American uh, college emergency physicians in terms of what sh you should have in a clinical decision rule. This uh, has a lot of uh, areas where it is wanting. First of all, it was not formally derived. There's no uh, sex uh, determination in here. We know that there's a, uh, a difference in the outcomes, male versus female. Uh, weak iterator reliability, that's a real uh, uh, problem. And basically they conclude that this is not really much better than your own intuition about a, a patient. And there is an acceptable miss rate that was decided, I think by ASAP a while ago, about the, uh, the idea is how many out of 100 MIs can you miss? Uh, and then numbers like around one or 2%. Obviously you can't make it 100%. You can't do that because I mean, you admit everybody. So there, there is some kind of ex acceptable miss rate that we have to have. And I think it's in that range. And so these folks say, this is not nearly as good as you think it is. And even though there are other der derivatives of this, like the HART2 score and the uh, HART pathway, that, which may be a little bit more sensitive, these folks uh, say, mm -mm, this thing needs a, a relook. It's you should be reconsidered and every emergency department's using this score. Uh, Jan, what do you think? I thought this is a great paper. Um, I really enjoyed reading it. I couldn't believe that, you know, I, I think we all remember life before the heart score and the fact that there's been 139 studies so far on this clinical decision tool that we have all definitely incorporated is pretty amazing. The fact that there's five different variants out there, uh, which they looked at as well, um, lumped them all together in this uh, appraisal of the score. And, you know, as much as I think that they're their conclusion is probably correct that it should be reconsidered based on the critique that they've given us. I, the, the horse has kind of left the barn on this one. I don't think the heart score is going to go away. Even if we throw darts at it and poke holes at it, I think that it's kind of here to stay. Um, so maybe, you know, the answer is to try to make it better in some way, shape or form. Cause I don't, I don't think people are going to give up their, their favorite heart score. Everybody's memorized it now. So, I mean, we're never going to go back on that, you know? Um, but I think that it, you know, there's some, the, the, the points that they make are really good. One of the points I really liked that they, that they made that despite its flaws, the hard score really, you know, it's not better than clinical judgment when you look at it objectively. However, you know, when you have a score that allows you to do certain things that you want to do, like send someone home and you're afraid to do it because maybe you're risk averse and you need that score to kind of reinforce your own clinical decision making. There's still value in this score, even though it may not be perfect. I mean, what's perfect out there anyway? Okay. Well, I think this is really interesting because, you know, Canadians are known for clinical decision instruments. I mean, this is where Ian Steele comes from. We've got our Ottawa ankle rules, our Ottawa knee rules, our Canadian CT head rules, all those types of things. But I have to tell you, the, the heart score is not drifted north of the border. And we're much more likely to be sending people home with, you know, uh, came in, came in with chest pain. We send people home with PEs that have a diagnosis of PE. We send our AFibers home, you know, uh, that aren't rate controlled, that we do get rate control or we convert. So I have not seen it widely adopted and I'm not using the heart score. So I could be an outlier in Canada, but we're not using the heart score. 
Do you what next? You know? <laughs> Clinical judgment. Gestalt. Well, you know, this paper says you're right. So there you go. <laughs> I love you know, papers that agree with yeah. me. <laughs> this They're my favorite. A, kind of like a one-off weirdo paper until the second paper came along. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You want to talk about number two? Okay, let's yeah. go to number two. All right. Number two is along the same lines. And this is a paper that's very recent, just came out in Annals of Emergency Medicine. Um, and they did here an, a prospective evaluation of clinical heart score agreement, accuracy, and adherence in some chest pain patients in the emergency department. This is from Bay State in Massachusetts. And what they did is they said, you know, when the heart score was made, like a lot of clinical decision instruments, you know, there were people with clipboards, research associates who were trained how to do this. They knew how to ask the questions. They knew what they were looking for. They checked boxes. It was very, you know, as objective as it can be. And then these things get released and the clinicians in the wild start using them as they use them, how they interpret things as they interpret them. So if you were to take somebody who was trained and was a research associate asking that same, pa that same patient, the questions, how it was kind of like derived to do it. And then you have the clinicians do what they do. How much do those two agree? I think it's a really interesting question. So they took 336 patients um, that basically had these two people coming at them, the clinician, the researcher, the research associate. And they found that there was quite a bit of disagreement between the two, which it doesn't surprise me at all when you say, you know, you train someone to do it right. And then you have a clinician who's, you know, interpreted the way that they interpret it. Um, and often, you know, it was right at that threshold, whether they get admitted or not. And there could be a difference of one point or more they found when they really compared the way that these two groups performed. Um, you know, whether the clinicians did right or wrong, they still didn't miss anything. So we're still doing an okay job, but they just said, you know, wait a second here, you know, when you're making decisions based on the heart score, realize that you could be a point or two off if you were to compare to someone who was formally trained in doing it. So, um, you know, this kind of thing has been seen before once a, once a score gets out there in the wild and people start using it, you know, it's never used exactly how it was derived. And we have to remind ourselves that it's important to know how these things were actually derived, which is kind of what paper number one talked a lot about. And well, I, I agree. And I really like how you say, you know, how it performs in a strict research environment compared to in the wild, right? <laughs> in the wild, <laughs> in the wild. But, uh, you know, I don't want to beat up on the heart score because I don't think this is unique to not just the heart score or clinical decision instruments. You just look at, you have a research team and have a very structured environment, and then you release it into the wild and see what happens. And you can take a look at when TPA first came out and they had really strict inclusion and exclusion criteria and all these all these extra people ensuring that they were following the protocol. And then there's the famous Cleveland study that they released it into the wild and you had 50% protocol violators, double the mortality rate predicted and triple the mortality rate compared to those people who didn't get TPA. So it's not unique. It's, uh, you know, once we get out of the strict research environment, fuzzy things start to happen. Uh, so we're beating up on this. Uh, I, I think it, it's just uh, nice that it basically takes something that we just kind of have, you know, bought a hook, line, and sinker. And some doctor said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, not so fast. Let's do number three. Yeah. So number three is a prospective validation and comparative analysis of coronary risk stratification strategies among ED patients with chest pain. And we've talked about the heart score, but Jan mentioned, hey, there are other scores out there. And so this trial attempted to answer which scoring system is the best, which one should I use? And so this was a multi-center prospective trial done in California. That's where Rick is right now. Jan, you're in California. I'm up in the great yep. white North. So this was a Kaiser study, right? And they looked at a composite outcome, MACE events, which you'll typically see in cardiac studies. So they looked at MI, cardiac arrest, cardiogenic shock, but then coronary revascularization, all cause mortality. That's a good one. And you know, the two scores that came out on top was the heart score plus their homegrown score called, I think you'd say it Ristra ACS. Um, I don't know. They had a sensitivity of 97%. And you go, okay, well, 97%, that's still less than the um, one to 2% miss rate that Rick was talking about promoted by ASEP, but it was equal to clinical gestalt. Go figure, right? 
And if you looked at the lower end of the 95% confidence interval around that sensitivity, it was 95%. So how comfortable, Jan, are you going to be missing one in five, or sorry, one in 20 or 5%? Is that going to be acceptable where you work? Yeah, no, 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 no it's okay. not. Yeah, and then they commented in the abstract about the great negative predictive value, but I'm just going to warn people, predictive value is dependent on prevalence. So go to the negative likelihood ratios. That's where the gold is, right? In the negative predictive value. And you want to see less than 0.1. And those two scores did actually have a good negative predictive value. Um, the authors like their score, but that's called the IKEA bit bias. We built it, we lack it, right? Yeah. And we've seen this many times where a homegrown score performs really well in their home field advantage, and then they release it into the wild and check out for external validity, and it doesn't perform as well. So my bottom line is uh, hearts are more complicated than ankles, and it may take you know some of this and not so much a clinical decision score. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I, I think we got the point here that the clinical decision rules are helpful at times, but ultimately it depends on our own judgment. Let's do number four. This is a di different topic. This is about um, the association of intra arrest transport versus continued on seat on scene resusc resuscitation with survival in a hospital uh, discharge. This is about out, out of hospital cardiac arrest and whether it's better to stay and play, as they say, or, or load and go. Uh, this is a propensity adjusted registry uh, analysis. So this is basically uh, a look at records uh, assessing basically what is better. And they had a huge number of patients here. They had 9,400 load and goes and about 18,000 uh, stay in plays. This is data from 2010 to 2015. So I think it's probably very uh, applicable to what we do. 192 EMS agencies were involved. This is a big deal study. One of the things that you should know too is what was the time to drive to the hospital? The time to drive to the hospital, median transfer time was 10 minutes. You know, it's like down the street, from, uh, you know, in, in LA here. Anyway, 10 minutes would be around the corner in LA, <laughs> you know, on traffic. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, five o'clock, forget it. It's like there, I can, I can see the hospital. <laughs> <laughs> You're not going to get there though. <laughs> uh, return of spontaneous circulation and favorable survival rates were significantly greater with the uh, resuscitation at the scene before you do any transport. It was 13% versus 14% for a return of spontaneous circulation, which is a huge difference. Uh, so they basically say, if you're trying to make the decision, uh, we, and we know CPR in a moving ambulance, CPR in the gurney, those kinds of things, it, it, it just, it's just a sham kind of thing. And then giving drugs and being in contact and going around the corner, it's just, they say, get it done in the field and your outcomes will be better. Yeah, I mean, when it comes to, you know, true cardiac arrest, there's there's really nothing that the hospital has to offer that the paramedics can't do. You know, if it's if it's really all about high quality CPR, which is really what it's all about, um, then, you know, staying on scene and doing that and seeing what happens and defibrillation, of course, um, you know, are things that you need to do right away. And if they're going to work, they're going to work and putting them in the ambulance and starting to transport them, you know, if anything makes those interventions probably worse. So, you know, this is now this is looking at a big you know group of people and um, nothing is controlled here. So there's obviously going to be bias in here. Why some paramedics stayed and played and why some people they put in the ambulance and left, you know, nothing of that is, is controlled. So this is only hypothesis generating, right, Ken? This is just observational data. So we can't make big conclusions, but it does jive with what I think we know, which is, you know, stay there and do good CPR and do the defibrillation, the things we know actually matter and get those things done and see what happens. But, you know, get it, hurrying into the the ambulance and going doesn't make a lot of sense when it comes to out of hospital cardiac arrest. Yeah. And I would just try to reframe the stay and play term to uh, stay and treat, right? Cause yeah. they're not playing. And so I got some feedback previously when I had used that term, which is just, it, it's just a term that's used. And so it's, it's stay and treat. Um, but you identified bias and one of the biases in these types of studies that people should know about is prognostication bias. And there are multiple domains to prognostication bias, but I want you to think about one of them if you're thinking about this study. And that's the one for uh, attrition bias. 
those adult patients with out of hospital cardiac arrest and unfavorable phenotypes. And we've all seen those people come into the emergency. You're like, I don't think they're going to do well. You know, they may or may not have had the resuscitation terminated early. And this means they would not have had the opportunity to even achieve ROSC. So we have to be careful uh, interpreting these, especially with these types of bias. Yeah. Uh, well, what are we going to do in the meantime? Uh, now we get into this issue of, uh, can you and I get into this with some frequency about, well, is this enough to change your practice? Uh, and we've got, we're talking about lives at stake here now. This is not a uh, insignificant outcome measure. And the differences were, were really quite substantial. Uh, in terms of favorable uh, survival, 7% versus 3%, double. Um, so if it wasn't randomized or controlled for, you have no idea how much contributed to that that was measured and unmeasured. So okay. it's interesting. It's hypothesis generating, but you'd have to do a study to convince me okay. that involved randomization. I got pain now. You know. <laughs> <laughs> this is so standard. Hey, listen, I got to I got to say one thing. I really do not like the term "stay and play" at all, and that, in fact, I hesitated even using the term because, it, but they use it in the paper, and I yeah. I never liked it. And um, I'm glad you brought it up because well, yeah, our paramedics too. colleagues, I mean, I, I would be like in the field, right? I mean, they own the field, they own the scene, they do such a great job. They assess people quickly, they provide really, really high quality CPR, they defibrillate people early. Um, and so I just want to give them the respect that they deserve. Yeah. You know, stay and treat doesn't rhyme, though. I know. I'll, I'll yeah. think of something else. All then. right. Uh, <laughs> What's next, guys? I think it's, is it number four we're doing? Yeah, number five. five. Oh, it's, five. That's me. Yeah. Well, this is a this is a good one. This is a good. This follow is a good one. Yeah. Yeah, because remember, so last year when we did this, we talked about the paramedic randomized trial. Basically, it was like one of the final nails in the coffin of Epi. I felt like that was you know it was really like you know the Epi doesn't help, and so so everybody they, stopped as, using it, right, Jan? Ex well, of course. <laughs> I mean, you know, exactly. High quality and evidence, we, and we ignore it. And we ignore it. And, you know, here's more um, if you need more. But I don't you know, you're right. It, until the until the guidelines and the algorithms really substantially change, people are going to follow what the algorithms tell them, even if even if the evidence is not there. But I digress. So this is about long term outcomes of the participants in that paramedic two randomized trial of adrenaline because it's in Britain. So it's adrenaline, not epi and out of hospital cardiac arrest. And so they basically said of the people who were in that study and got epinephrine and and actually survived, if you were to follow them out further, maybe there was, maybe there was some benefit there. Maybe they're neurologically better. Maybe they survived longer. You know, could there be some benefit there? And the answer is no. Um, it still didn't matter, especially in the outcome that we care about, which is neurologic survival. Um, it didn't really matter. So they actually followed these patients out. There were not very many of them that survived, um, very few of them. And then as they went along six months, 12 months, there were even fewer. Um, and, and of course they talked about the methodology of how difficult this is to do. A lot of them were, you know, they were not neurologically intact. So their proxies and their family members have to fill out the questionnaires and it's hard to get to, you know, really good evaluations of them. But despite all those limitations, it doesn't look like it matters, even if you fast forward out in time. Uh, this is the nail in the coffin of this. Can we stop? You know, I, I think we've got it. I think we've got it. Uh, Ken, you want to pick up number six? Yeah, sure. This is a really good uh, paper as well, because there's a progression that you see in the literature. And it's a similar story arc that you've probably heard before. So this is the hypothermia versus normothermia for out of hospital cardiac arrest. And this idea of targeted temperature management started about 20 years ago, with a couple of small studies suggesting benefit. And then everybody got excited, it seemed, and they established cooling centers and cooling equipment, and you had cooling centers of excellence, and protocols were created, quality metrics were created. Uh, stop me if you've heard this story before. So then along came uh, TTM1, and that was published in, I believe, 2013. And it didn't find a benefit between driving the temperature down to 33 degrees Celsius or 36 degrees Celsius. So both groups were cooled, but there was no difference. This is TTM2. 
And what they did different is they took a step further and said, okay, we'll cool half of them randomized. And the other half, we just won't let them get hot. So we kept them at normothermic or below, but it wasn't cooling them. Spoiler alert, no difference. Same neuro outcome in both groups, no mortality, no mortality benefit. So this is suggesting that we don't need to cool people, but Hey, rumor has it. There's a TTM three coming. You know what they're going to do, Jan? What? Cooling versus let the temperature ride. <laughs> and then we'll know, do you really actually need to cool people? Because this gets into the intervention bias of we have to normalize numbers. We have to normalize the blood pressure. We have to normalize the temperature. We have to normalize all of these things. And maybe the body's a bit smarter than us. Mm -hmm. You know, I would have uh, thought that the opposite of cooling would, the study would be looking at heating them up. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, okay, no. <laughs> all, right, all right. There you go. Number seven, early rhythm control therapy in patients with atrial fibrillation. This is New England Journal. It's a large study. It's industry sponsored. 135 centers were involved in this. And look at the number of patients. There have got 2,800 patients who have who were enrolled with what they called new atrial fibrillation. That means within a year. So it really wasn't new, new kind of thing. And their primary outcomes are cardiovascular mortality stroke or hospitalization, and they followed them out at five years, which is uh, unusually long. And at the end of five years, they stopped this study. I thought they should have stopped it long before, but anyway, they stopped it at five years uh, for efficacy. In that, patients did better in terms of those three outcomes when it came to um, a AFib, if they were um, rhythm controlled, as you might and it was 5% versus 3.9%. And the kind of interesting, because when you have a hard, large study with so many people, small differences become statistically significant. And then the question is, well, is that clinically a significant difference? In this case, the number needed to treat is 90. So there's not a huge difference. But the fact of the matter is, is that if I had my druthers, I'd rather be uh, having a, a normal, normal rhythm rather than flopping around it uh, with AFib uh, at you know a rate of 90 or 100, 110. Uh, death and strokes were each, each similar in the two groups. So what, where the difference was primarily, and this is look where you, when you see a, a composite outcome, here's a composite outcome of stroke and, uh, and death and hospitalization. Well, the only one that was really different was the hospitalization. Um, so anyway, sinus rhythm, I like that. Uh, this rate versus rhythm thing has been going on for years and I thought it's basically ridiculous. That's only my personal opinion, however. Well, this I just wanted to say, keep, keep, me, keep me in normal sinus rhythm. I don't want to be AF. Flopping around? <laughs> no, Jan got the joke. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I didn't get I, all those All those youngins out there. I... Um... You know, we this is one of those areas, AFib is, you know, where Ken and I practice very differently. But this was not a study of ED patients. These were no. outpatients and they, you know, they had had an AFib for less than a year. So it's a little different than the other AFib rate versus rhythm papers that we've talked about um, recently. But I interpreted this and you made the exact point that I was going to make, Rick, which was that although they spun it as like a positive thing, that rhythm control made a big difference because of that statistical significance, because it was so many people. Like really, when I looked at it, I felt like it wasn't really much of a difference, you know, on an individual patient level. Um, but I, you know, I think that, um, you know, it's interesting. This, this, this discussion is going to keep going on and on. No, I like it to stop to tell you the truth. <laughs> <laughs> Not I if the Canadians have anything to do with it. They're, it seems like they, they're the ones that publish most of the papers about ED. I, I want, I want that atrial kick. I want that 10% <laughs> in my cardiac yes. output. It was yeah. made there for some reason, you know? <laughs> yeah. All right. Number eight. Um, number eight is a just a lovely little simple paper, and I it's just great. It's Australian. It was sent in as a research letter, which means basically it was so simple that it was really not that long of a paper. Uh, it's very straightforward. It's a double-blind randomized controlled trial of whether or not when you have somebody that comes in with epigastric pain, you're give, giving them their GI cocktail, you know, is just giving them the antacid alone as good or worse than or better than the antacid plus the lidocaine, um, viscous lidocaine 
Or even if you put a lidocaine solution in there, you squirt in some of the lidocaine liquid, which was interesting too. I never really thought about doing that. Um, and so they had 89 patients. They randomized them to these three different groups, the antacid, or you got the stuff with the viscous gel, or you got stuff with the solution. And they all got a little bit better and it didn't really make a big difference. There are about you know, 30 people in each group. So it wasn't a huge study, but the, the people who got the antacid alone thought it was a little more palatable. Uh, which is interesting. And um, it just, you know, now it makes you it kind of rethink, like, do I really need to order the extra lidocaine, that extra step that the nurse goes to squirt it in there? I don't know. I think the lidocaine, if you've ever had a GI cocktail, you know, it gives you that numbing feeling. And I think, you know, patients sort of feel like they got something special that they can't get at home. So there's some, you know, placebo effect there in my mind, but I thought it was an interesting little paper, thought provoking. Yeah, but the placebo effect in this paper, if people had, ooh, I've got that tingling and that numbness, you would right. have uh, thought that the bias would have favored the outcome. So that actually makes me believe the study even more. And this has changed my practice because I didn't have high quality evidence to be using the um, the viscous in the first place, the lidocaine viscous. So this has actually changed one of the small papers that's changed my practice and backed away from ordering, you guys call it the GI cocktail. We call it the pink lady because it's <laughs> our, our, our xylocaine viscous is, is red and you add yeah. it to the mailox and you get this beautiful little shooter, this cocktail. So we call it the uh, pink lady. But now if you have patients that come in that usually get the pink lady and now she's just white and she's not wearing yeah. a pink dress, don't you think they're mm -hmm. going to be like, Hey doc, something's missing. Something's missing from my, yeah, no, from I, cocktail. I agree. Yeah. No, I agree. And, they're, and, they're, and it's not like they're saying, oh, we've proven harm with this either. But right. I think with the, um, you know, I use the pink lady or the GI cocktail for the people that come in with sore throats and stuff like that. And I'll get them to gargle back there and give them some immediate relief. And, and so there's other reasons besides that uh, to use it. But yeah, no, for newcomers with uh, GERD and stuff, I'm not, I'm not using the, uh, the pink stuff anymore. Well, in the real old days, they would add uh, belladonna to it as yeah. well, so that it was, and which I think is green. And yeah, it was a green goddess. We called it the green goddess. Yeah, made their that, eyeballs really, their pupils really big. <laughs> but at least they know they got something, you know. They didn't get this. Uh, something for coming. I, yeah. I can get that my Maylax any place. You're probably going to charge me 50 bucks for this little shot here. <laughs> All right, number nine. Hey, this is another practice uh, changing paper for me. And this was about self-obtaining vaginal swabs. And it was a non-inferior study, non-inferiority study uh, to compare people doing their own vaginal swabs to the clinicians doing the vaginal swabs for diagnosing gonorrhea and chlamydia. It was a single center. So you have to question external validity. Uh, it was a convenient sample. So there could have been some selection bias but they got over 500 people enrolled with the gold standard being the uh, endocervical swab. And the results were that self-swabbing were non-inferior to clinicians swabbing with a sensitivity of 95%. And the majority of the patients saying, you know what, I'd prefer self-swabbing. So uh, when I read this paper, I said, you know what, I'm going to change my practice. And I've actually, since this paper has come out, have changed my practice and am doing much more uh, offering of self-swabbing. But are you still doing the pelvic exam or are you? That's the so point. that's the caution. Yes. That's the caution in here. And so, you know, this study will change my practice, but it's not going to change my practice. If there's another reason to do a pelvic exam, do a pelvic exam, right? But if this is just for getting a swab for just this concern, absolutely, you can do self-swabbing. But you need more information if you are dealing with other uh, pelvic concerns. There's a bunch of papers on this topic in the primary care literature. And this is the first one that I saw that was very focused on the emergency department. So uh, I think it's kind of like a, a, a great paper in that regard. I just, no. I want to just caution people because I think this is really tempting when you read this paper oh, to be like, yes. oh, perfect. I don't need, you know, because nobody wants to do a pelvic exam. I mean, um, you know, and I, so this is the kind of thing where you read it, and you're, you just jump to that. And I, you know, just caution people that really this is just looking at test characteristics that if you look at the, how the test performs when the clinician does it during a pelvic versus the patient doing it, the test characteristics are, are fine. So, you know, if you have a patient, like Ken said, that either a doesn't need a pelvic exam for whatever reason, or B, you know, uh, is, or is refusing it, you know, or you can't do one for whatever, you know, this is, it's a fine way to go in that, in that, in that domain, but, but, you know, don't skip the pelvic exam. If it's indicated, if you need to find out where the pain's coming from, if you're looking for PID, if you're, you know, those, there's still reasons to do it. So this, this is, is really about looking, swabbing, not about pelvic right. exams. That's right. And that's a great point to make. 
Number 10 is entitled a randomized controlled trial of ceftriaxone and doxycycline with or without metronidazole flagyl for the uh, treatment of acute PID. This is in Clinical Infectious Diseases, which is the New England Journal of Infectious Diseases. And um, pretty interesting. Uh, the current belief is, is that ceftriaxone and doxycycline are, are probably or, uh, uh, okay. However, we know that there are a lot of anaerobes associated with PID and anaerobe killers are clindamycin and metronidazole. So these guys are saying, what if we add the third drug, the anaerobe killer, the pus former killer uh, to these two, 233 women, they're gonna get the standard therapy with or without the uh, metronidazole. This is uh, from two EDs and one STD clinic in Pittsburgh. Is it STD or STI? I don't, I don't. STI. I don't, is it? STI. Did they change it? Mm -hmm. I missed that day. Uh, Anyway, all get ceftriaxone. They get the old dose, 250 milligrams instead of the new dose, 500 milligrams, plus doxy, as you would normally expect. And half of them got the uh, metronidazole. And it's kind of interesting. The primary outcome was clinical improvement in three days. Three days? You would expect one antibiotic will make a, a difference in three days? Good luck. Well, uh, the outcome was the same at that period of time. So they got to find something good about this study. Uh, the clinical cure rate was thir at 30 days uh, was the, uh, the same. Adverse event rates were the same, but le let's carry it out a little further. Pelvic tenderness was less than 30 days. That was it, 9% versus 20%. Uh, I think that they just kind of found, they just stumbled on this. What about pelvic pain at 60 days? What about pelvic pain at one year? You know, Their primary outcome was three days and now they're talking about 30 days. And so, uh, they say add metronidazole routinely. I I wouldn't, you know, frankly argue with that, but I have a little problem with this with this study. Uh, I thought this ahead, was Jen. I I you know the CDC recommendations always drove me crazy. I hated the way that they put plus minus metronidazole and didn't really tell you when you know you should or shouldn't use it. And so I always you know found that I I would err on the side of giving it you know rather than not give it. And this sort of I guess to me when I read it sort of validated what I've been doing. Of course, since it's an infectious disease paper, they focused a lot on the microbiology and the and the you know the what grew what and et cetera. But um, you know when these patients all got enrolled, fifty five percent of them were BV bacterial vaginosis positive. Um, that's, a, that's a lot. Uh, and I think that that 30 day outcome, 9% versus 20% of pelvic tenderness to me was, was, was pretty important. I, I don't think that there's any reason not to add the metronidazole. They didn't find a lot of adverse events, although people would think that if you're adding metronidazole, you're going to get all these, you know, side effects. And they really didn't find that in this group of, of patients. So I think for me, it's like, give the metronidazole. I'm a bit more, um, what's the word I'm looking for here? Skeptical? Skeptical? Canadian. <laughs> so, you know what I did, Jan, I, you know, I, I picked up on what Rick was saying about, you know, what, what, what about all these different outcomes? What the heck? And so I actually went to clinicaltrials.gov because I have a problem and I searched up what their primary and secondary outcomes were originally. And you know what they did? They switched them. Oh, they dear. flipped them. Their primary, their original primary outcome became their secondary outcome. And one of their secondary outcomes was elevated to their primary outcome. And that always goes, you know, without an explanation, I, I kind of like, I don't know what to do with this. Oh, dear, Ken, you just like threw a dart at the balloon and like Sorry. deflated it for Sorry me. Sorry about that. <laughs> wah, wah, wah. Good pickup, though. That's awesome. Well, I, I, I agree with you, Jen. Uh, I think if you get PID, I think that's a significant diagnosis. And I think that if I can uh, maybe get a little edge, I don't think it's a big deal to, to add this oral drug. It, you know, it's yeah. used for all kinds of things. And I think that um, I would do it. Yeah, I still do it. All right, um, number 11 is, mm, it's about CTs and cancer. Uh, and so this is called risk of hematologic malignant neoplasms from abdominal pelvic CT radiation in patients who underwent appendectomy and it was in JAMA surgery. And it's a, it's a South Korean paper. And they start off in their introduction, interestingly enough, saying that the association between CT scans and developing cancer in later life is still controversial, which actually, I, I don't really think it is controversial, but they decided they're going to take another look at it. So they look at 10 years of data of patients who got appendectomies and they divide them up into two groups. Those who 
who got pre-op CT scans and those who didn't. And so they actually have people in Korea who don't get CT scans for appendectomy. And, and there were a bunch of kids in this group. So maybe that's why. And then they looked at what age they got their CT scan and then what happened in their lives and the rate of hematologic malignancy development. And they looked specifically at that because the, you know, the idea is that the red bone marrow is more radiosensitive. And so that's more likely to transform. But they did also look at other types of cancers in their data as well. And so they ended up about 800,000 patients. So you see that about 300,000 got CTs and 500,000 did not, which was interesting in Korea. I bet the numbers would be much different in other countries. Mm -hmm. um, but they found an increased rate of leukemia um, in the patients that got the radiation. And it was most pronounced in patients who were zero to 15 years old in the kids. Um, and so this was really interesting. I wasn't surprised to see it. And they say, basically, you know, use your CT judiciously. I love that word judiciously. Yeah, this is a paper I think reinforces the ultrasound first principle. I mean, we knew it was there. Well, these guys put a, put a number on it. And, you know, when you look at the percentage increase, it was like 40% increase. When you, I would use that number to say, um, that's why I would be a cautious in using a CT. I would not use the absolute number because the absolute number is obviously very, very small. But uh, I think it was kind of interesting to use this database. It's interesting also to me because they are very close to Japan. And in Japan, everybody gets a, T, a CT. Every doctor's office has a CT. It's like, what, are, what kind of doctor are you without a CT scan? They, Japan does a, a multiple of the number of scans that we do in this country. I, I, I don't know why I said that. I'll bet if you followed these patients out even farther in their lives, the rates would even be higher. You know, I mean, this was not even that far out in terms yes, of how long, exactly. you know, they get that they're probably higher. Exactly. Ken, you're silent here. Because uh, I agree with Jan, uh, you know, just uh, be judicious. I like the word. Uh, I like what yeah. she said. And think about before you just light everybody up, especially the younger the person. Uh, and if they're younger and thinner, we can use an ultrasound first to get the answer that yeah. we uh, yes, are looking for. Please do. Yeah, ultrasound. And then if you have access, which not everybody does, and I get it to an MRI, that's another thing mm -hmm. you can do um, as yep. part of an algorithm to avoid this. And maybe a surgeon will actually take them to the OR without a CT scan. Maybe. Oh, God. <laughs> and even if they uh, have appendicitis, maybe not even take out their appendix. I am not going to take out your appendix today and go with non-operative treatment and give them antibiotics. That's also yeah. a reasonable thing to suggest to a patient um, from a general surgeon standpoint, because we don't suggest that. Um, but, you know, like something like one third of those people will have their appendix removed in the next year anyway. So many of them are delaying the inevitable. Well, you know, it's kind of interesting, Jan, you pointed out that 500,000 of these people did not get a CT scan while 300,000 did. So it's not routinely done in this country. I would have to say oh, that yeah. CT is, uh, is your ticket into the operating room kind of thing. So I'm kind of surprised at the, uh, at the ratio uh, in Korea. So in Canada, we'll um, with the pediatric population, we're doing, um, you know, a lot more ultrasound and are much more judicious with the CT scanners. And then as you know, it's, it, as you get older, right, the percentage goes up. If you're a hundred, a hundred percent of those people with belly pain are getting a CT. Light them up. Oh yeah. Yeah. Next. Ah, Yes, this is number 12. And this paper comes from a long line of papers uh, that do not support the claim that contrast will fry your kidneys or your patient's kidneys, I guess. Um, and these are Canadian authors and they did some statistic wizardry and it's officially called fuzzy regression discontinuity design. Oh, you don't yeah, need to right. know the details. It's, it's, it's statistical jujitsu. Um, but they determined whether IV contrast exposure is associated with clinically significant long-term kidney impairment. And it's an observational study. It's not some randomized control trial. So they have like huge numbers, 85,000 patients getting a CT scan and how they identified them is they had a positive D dimer and they got a PE rule out. And here's the big sort of, you know, spoiler alert. They found no association with harm. Now that doesn't prove safety, but it certainly doesn't support the claim that there is harm with high quality evidence for using contrast when you're getting these CTs. So my advice would be, hey, print out this paper, 
when you're walking down through the radiology department, all the doors are shut and the lights are off because it's the radiology department, slide this one under the door. <laughs> you know, about five or six <laughs> or seven years ago, Mike Heller, one of our faculty, I remember he, he, he said, this whole thing is bogus and there's no uh, issues here with this creatinine. And it was like, he was like way ahead of his time. And it turns out, there were some earlier papers, sure, that basically said the same thing, but it turned out it seems that that he's right. Um, Thirteen. Steve, is, uh, didn't didn't uh, Steve Colucciello do a study at his place too? I think Steve Colucciello uh, printed out something on uh, you know his experience with his big institution in the south. There, coming to the same conclusions. Yes. Yeah, so you guys, it, go ahead. It, the, can they, do the Canadians can, I mean, they, are they more, are they smarter about this? I mean, are you, you know, has, has practice changed and you're not, you know, given a hard time for people who have elevated creatinines and you want a CT scan, you know, like, how does it work there? Correct. But I don't, yeah. but I wouldn't say we're smarter. I would just say, you know, we, we work in a different yeah. medical legal environment and a different uh, payment model. And so there's other incentives besides the evidence, I think, that are influencing these things. Number 13 does address this issue about creatinine screening. It says uh, impact of creatinine screening on contrast-induced nephropathy following CT for stroke. This is American Journal of Emergency Medicine. And uh, it asks this question, do you need to do this uh, knee-jerk kind of creatinine? This is a single-centered chart review. Okay, so we've got issues. Uh, but creatinine, no creatinine. And the issue is too, Normally, they talk about a bump in your creatinine uh, as a, as a uh, reflection of uh, toxicity. When in fact, this one looks at acute injury, uh, mortality, and dialysis. Kind of really very uh, tangible kinds of things. This is 382 subjects. Uh, they had a, they developed a protocol that said no screening, and so they looked at the before the protocol and after the protocol. No difference was seen in cases of new nephropathy. Seven percent versus seven percent point one of uh, or any other significant outcome related to uh, toxicity of these um, uh, radio contrast materials. So 7%, 7%, well, contrast or not. So they basically support the argument of don't bother doing the creatinine, get the CT if you need it, um, and, and go about your business. Yeah, I read this yeah. as a uh, TPA paper, actually, not a renal paper. <laughs> I, you know, I, yeah, this is not a great paper. I, you know, this is just, you know, looking at chart review and that kind of thing, but you know, it's true. We, we do have these conditions, you know, trauma is one of them too, where we don't wait for the creatinine, right? We get the CT scan because we need it. And you don't see, you know, all those patients having terrible issues as far as we know, um, you know, all going on dialysis and having problems. So, you know, I, I just think that we got to get past this and this is, this is one topic I would like to stop talking about for sure. <laughs> all right. It's agreed. We're out of there. All right, the next one, let's move on to pneumothorax, um, kind of a fun topic. And so, um, you know, there's been lots of papers about how to treat pneumothoraces for a long time. This one's from New England Journal. It's about conservative versus interventional treatment for spontaneous, primary spontaneous pneumothorax. And basically they're talking about, you know, the ones that come in that are spontaneous that are, that are pretty big. They're at least a third or bigger, medium to large. And, you know, those ones, could we just observe them and do nothing? And so they, this is New Zealand, Australia, New Zealand, and they randomized, uh, this was non blinded, of course, but they randomized patients into one of the two groups. It was a non-inferiority trial. That's how it was designed. And they had a group that got a pigtail or a small bore catheter um, and to, or, or basically we just watched you and they had a 313, 300, uh, 316 patients, so just over 300 patients. And they looked at the re-expansion and it was non-inferior to just basically be conservative and, and watch them, which was an interesting thing. I think most of us would be very tempted to put something in there, whether it was a Heimlich or how However, you treat them, most of us would not just watch them, at least, you know, my experience. And I thought this was a very thought provoking paper. It was, it was fine to do that and just watch them. So um, I liked it. Yeah, I, I love this paper because, you know, it, it fits with my philosophy of less is more and uh, don't just do something, stand there. And when you mentioned that these were, you know, like, you know, medium, like they had to have at least a third. I mean, the mean 
pneumothoracy yeah. size was 65 percent these big. are not like oh they're you know this was yeah these are big things and so you know conservative management and you know when shared decision making comes up and stuff like that if i was the patient i mean the literature is what the literature is right but if i was the patient treat me conservatively i don't want a pigtail or a garden hose I agree. I would say, watch me. I mean, you're absolutely yeah. right. If I was given the choice, I would say, so you're telling me that they're relatively equivalent. Okay. Absolutely. Watch me. Let's see what yeah. happens. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I would do. Right? Yeah. You would wonder how many people are going to change practice uh, over, over, over one paper. There may be others that support the same idea, uh, but we're always fearful of this thing kind of getting worse when they're home and now they collapse the whole lung or it turned into a, for some weird reason, or turned into a tension, although they don't suggest that that really happened, but uh, the outcomes could be nasty. Yeah. And that's why, I mean, discharge instructions are always so important and it takes place in a clinical context and with the patient in front of you. And if you are, uh, you know, have the interaction with them, like they're not going to have follow-up. They're not going to be able to accept, access follow-up you're quite concerned about this discharge there's nothing wrong with putting a pigtail in right it's just that you, you have the option now not to mm -hmm. right and right. if a patient really doesn't want it you know you can also you know feel comfortable that okay well this isn't an unreasonable thing to do um you know they did just to note if you were going to maybe embrace this um that they watched them for at least four hours so this was not mm -hmm. just a like you know just go ahead and go home. You know, they did watch them for a while to make sure that things didn't get bigger, or get worse. So it was a re very, you know, reasonable observation period. So, so it wasn't a drive through that, you know, you pulled up to your yeah. second window, you got the chest x-ray. Yeah. You got a big pneumo, but you should be fine. <laughs> yeah. Here's your papers. Go home. Well, Bye -bye. Yeah, our, exactly. Many of our emergency departments, they've already been watched for four hours. It was just in the waiting room before they got <laughs> that's called chairs. Yeah. yeah. Uh, 15, Ken. Yeah, so um, this is uh, on the mortality and complication rates in adult trauma patients receiving tranexamic acid. And since CRASH-2 was published in 2015, and it showed a 1.5% absolute decrease in mortality when you gave TXA in the trauma patients. But there were always some concerns about external validity to the U.S., and this was a single-center observational study in the U.S. saying, hey, what's our experience with this? And when they looked at the demographics and compared it to the original CRASH-2 cohort, these patients were a little older in the US, but they had slightly lower all-cause mortality, lower bleeding mortality. But this is the statistic that got me, is that there was more than triple the thrombotic events. It was 6.6% in this single center trauma study versus 2% in the randomized control trial of CRASH-2. And we know that, you know, looking for harm is not always done the best. And this, you know, was done in the U.S. where they're probably looking at it more closely. Um, the evidence still supports TXA in trauma patients, but it does raise the concern about people that claim, hey, come on, it's just TXA. It's safe. It doesn't cause an increase in harm. Well, this suggests that there is an association of a potential increase in venous thromboembolism. Yeah, I think that that, that is exactly right. This is a Jerry Hoffman kind of thing where basically he, it's not one of those things where, well, there's no harm. Uh, I think the early paper suggested there was no harm. This paper suggested that 6% of the people did have a problem with this, with this, you know, harmless, uh, harmless drug. And even in the patients who, we're getting some benefit. The number needed to treat was in the 60s. So it's like, it's not like you'll, you'll be harming somebody if you don't give this stuff. I think yeah, we're all- have to, You go, go ahead. ahead, sorry. I was just going to say, you know, when, when Crash 2 came out and, and the rates were that low, the 2%, we were all kind of like, really? Wow, that's surprising. I thought there would be more, you know? And then this one kind of comes along. You're like, oh, see, I knew it. I knew it was higher. Yeah. I, but I, I would caution the interpretation is because the patients here were in, you know, a well-developed, robust yeah. trauma center where they were going to get more surgery and yeah. surgery is associated with more VTE, whereas in a, you know, a developing nation where some of these crash two trial sites were, they were getting TXA. 
they, they may not have gotten as many procedures and surgeries that would have risked their VTE risk. So and diagnostic studies, right? We study people up the wazoo with and, the, you know, and, and whatever, any them. little sign of something where, you know, ordering a study and we find more stuff. So and we it find be it. Like, yeah, yeah. And that's why I thought, yeah, they would, they would dive down and get the granular detail of the potential harms compared to the crash two trial investigators. Yeah. Uh, number 16 looks at our urgent care centers and whether they are able to pull off non-urgent visits from the emergency department, which seems like an intuitively, uh, you know, a yes kind of thing. Uh, and there's a reason I have this paper in here because I'm, I want to set it up for paper number 17. But in any case, uh, it's an analysis of six state emergency department database, uh, an open urgent care center in the zip code where that hospital was uh, 17% of the patients had a urgent care center in the neighborhood. An open urgent care center reduced the number of uninsured visits to the emergency department by 21%, that's a lot, and Medicaid visits by 29%, which is a big uh, number. So they basically say urgent care centers are likely treating patients who would have otherwise been seen in the emergency department and therefore could reduce healthcare expenditures. That's the line I'm interested in, and therefore can reduce healthcare expenditures. Uh, do you think that that's always the case? Um, uh, my question was, <laughs> uh, what's the overall net impact? Uh, um, adding, you, go, you know, you uh, urgent care center plus emergency volumes, and what did you end up with? And then I went, oh, what's the next paper? <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Number seven. So we just, yeah, I'll just do 17. It's kind of a good lead in. Um, this uh, number 17 is just kind of building on that topic. And, you know, um, ED visits are super expensive. And so the assumption is that if you open up these urgent care centers and they're going to be cheaper, we know that that's true. And if you were just doing a substitution of the visit, a one-to-one -one substitution, well, then it's going to save you money. But is that really what happens? And so they look at this big database and they look at these zip codes where they have urgent care or urgent cares there and they don't. And they basically found that that's not what happens. It's not like a one-to-one -one substitution. You know, if you build it, they will come. And in fact, they found that um, in, by their estimates that 37 additional urgent care visits occur for each deterred ED visit. For that one substitution, you get 37 plus more visits. So therefore, it's more expensive to have the urgent care there. You're not saving any money. You end up spending more money because people just use the urgent care for stuff that they wouldn't necessarily, well, the, you know, you can make assumptions as to why that is. The paper doesn't get into why that is, but they, they kind of elaborate on probably some of the reasons, but it's not, you know, intuitive. It's not just a one-for-one -one substitution. So basically it costs the health system money to open an urgent care center is what they, is what they conclude, I think. Right. One of the things I found this well, it, it, this hardening, go ahead, Ken. Well, I was just gonna say, you're, you're decreasing the barriers to care at times. And one of the barriers is how long am I gonna be staying there? And what's my charge or copay or whatever you guys have in the US. But even even when we did this in our local area, right? Um, we, you know, you, we opened another service, sort of like a fast track that was outside the hospital, sort of like an urgent care where you could get labs and x-rays, but certainly nothing emergent, right? And yes, our emergency volume went down, and the volume, of course, went up in this other because it started at zero. And when we looked at the end of the year, we were servicing more people in the end. At the end of the day, we were seeing more people. Uh, and so, like Jan said, if you build it, they will come. And if you build it and make it really convenient and in their neighborhood and have low access costs, um, what they wouldn't have gone for that sore throat maybe and, and waited eight hours. And I don't know what the, I'm just pulling that number. Out. Um, they might go to the urgent care clinic for an hour. Right. Yeah. They concluded the a net effect was substantially more costly for the health system. Uh, one of the other things I found discouraging about this paper is they looked at, you know, one emergency department visit that was, could, that could be avoided in terms of the cost of that. One ER visit, one thousand six hundred forty-six dollars, and these are these are not asthma, admission, surgery. This is the, an urgent care visit, one thousand six hundred and forty-six dollars. Embarrassing. 
Yeah. So now they have to try to find, you know, they were trying to deter patients from going to EDs and now they have to find ways to deter people from going to urgent cares too. Um, <laughs> you know, right. And I can't, now you can't go to the ED, but we really don't want you to go to the urgent care either. So this is where, you know, these televisits and nurse advice lines and lots of other solutions. And that's what they talk about in their discussion is sort of going into that universe of how do you even discourage them from going in anywhere at all, which, you know, but we, we okay. get this in our area. We have a system set up where our whole s- province can call a and speak to a registered nurse. And when they implemented that, um, you know, that the, the purpose was to, to decrease the cost of the system and divert people away from uh, ex- more expensive clinician visits. And what they found was that uh, demand for the service, oh, this is convenient. I can pick up my phone. Um, and they'd go through an algorithm and yes, they, a lot of people, they diverted, but they were seeing way more. And the ones they couldn't divert, they sent to the emergency department. And a lot of them come and say, well, they told me I was supposed to come. I didn't think I needed to right. come. I called them and they said, yeah, no, I needed to come. And I just want some advice. Yeah. Everybody's covering their butt kind of thing, you know, yeah. you know, so we, yeah. are the, we are the bottom of the bird cage of medicine. At all, at we are all. the social. I uh, know we are the light in the house of medicine that is always on for anyone yes. at any time for anything. Oh God, I'm apple pie and motherhood. <laughs> all right, guys, I think that is the completion of 17 papers. There is a, a few minutes left for questions, and if you have any questions in there, don't hesitate to. I'm going to give you my email address. If you have any questions, comments, disagreements, wrbucata at gmail.com. Wrbucata gmail. Got come. I will get to get them to Ken or Jan if you have them. That's it. Thanks for listening. Uh, there's another session coming up with another 16 papers uh, for this afternoon. So uh, we'll see you then. Well, I mean, for everybody who saw this episode, how could they not attend the second half? Uh, <laughs> it's even better than the first. <laughs> oh, part two, bigger, louder, faster. Exactly. Absolutely. All right. See y'all. Yep. Thanks. <laughs>